What's up, everybody? Merry Christmas, happy Thanksgiving. Good to see you guys. Glad that you guys are here. And uh, those of you here in Spring Hill, welcome, everybody. Those of you at our Columbia location, welcome to you as well. Everybody watching, worshiping online, we're glad you are here. My name's Chris, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's an honor to have all of you here. Um, Some of you are here maybe from out of town, visiting for the holiday weekend, and lots of you are here for the very first time. So Bridge family, can you help me welcome everybody who's joining us for the first time right now? Thanks for being here, you guys. Welcome home, everybody. Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it open to 1 Peter chapter 2. That's where we're going to look today, 1 Peter chapter 2, so you can open it or uh, click to your Bible app on your phone or whatever. If you don't have a Bible, the verses that we talk about are going to be on the screen here in just a second. And uh, while you're turning there, I just want to remind you of something you just heard uh, that's exciting that's happening in the life of our church. Uh, You know, as a church leader, one of the things you always do is you're always kind of listening to the Lord and asking the question, God, how are you moving in our body? How are you working? And how can we as a body join you in that work. And a few years ago, as we asked that question, we just began to recognize that there was this groundswell when it comes to adoption. It's just passion for adoption. And so we began to see that the Lord was giving us this passion and movement toward both physical adoption and spiritual adoption through salvation. And uh, so we just put a name to it. We called it No More Fatherless. And that sort of became the rallying cry for our church for about the past three years or so. And we, over the, those three years, just started hearing from other pastors who would say, guys, uh, we see what the Lord's doing at the bridge in terms of your adoption culture. Like, how can we establish that at our church? Can you help us do that? And unfortunately, the answer to that question when they would ask was, we, we don't really have the resources to help right now. We want to, but we, we don't have the resources for that. And so uh, that's what this new nonprofit that we're going to start called No More Fatherless is all about. It's about helping all of those pastors and so many more across the world that want to establish a No More Fatherless culture in their church to eradicate both physical and spiritual fatherlessness. And so, man, we're just praying that the Lord will raise up a hundred churches that establish a No More Fatherless culture. We get the opportunity to be a part of that. We're gonna be giving the No More Fatherless offering in just a couple of weeks on December 13th. And I say giving on purpose because as we give, all of that is gonna go through the bridge to kind of be the base foundation for the startup admin costs for this new nonprofit that we're gonna start to help resource other churches and their adoption culture and also it'll help us double down on our adoption culture here. So that's what the offering is all about. And as for my family, Vanessa and I right now are just praying, God, how would you have us participate in the No More Fatherless offering? And so what I wanna ask you to do as our church family is just join us in praying that. God, how would you have us participate? What would you have us give? For some of you, it'll be the biggest gift you give this year. will be to No More Fatherless. And for others, it'll be super sacrificial. And so would you just pray and then be obedient to whatever God says? And we'll come together on December 13th and then just celebrate Celebrate what God's going to do as he spreads and multiplies no more fatherless all over the world. Sound good? All right, cool. Well, uh, today we are finishing a series that we're just been, we've been calling Identity Theft. And uh, what we're doing in the series is we're talking about who God says we are. And the reason that that's important is because I think the enemy's primary strategy uh, as he attacks us is to convince us to live in an identity that's no longer ours. The Bible calls him a, a condemner of the brethren. If he can condemn us and get us to live in identities that are no longer um, ours, he'll get us super off track with our lives. And so over the last several weeks, We've just been anchoring our lives in who the Bible says we are. And so we started this series and we said that um, in Christ, the truest thing about you is that you've been adopted as God's very own son or daughter. That was week one. Week two, we said, if if you're a follower of Jesus, you're uh, his son or daughter, that means that you are no longer slave to your sin. Rather, you've been set free from slavery um, to sin. Galatians says it's um, for freedom that Christ has set us free. That was week two. Week three, we talked about how if you're in Christ, you're not just in Christ or not just a follower of Jesus. You're also an ambassador for Christ. And today we're going to tie a bow on this series and talk about a fourth aspect of our identity that I think is super important. And also I think it's something that we don't talk about um, very much. And so let me set it up this way and then I'll tell you what it is. Uh, a couple years ago, I was on an airplane. And now what I've learned in travel over the years is that there are two types of people on the airplane, all right? There's the person um, who wants to talk to you the entire flight. And then there's the person who hates the person who talks to you the entire flight. And I know some of you in the room right now, uh, you are that person who's the talker on the plane. And so can I just be lovingly blunt with you right now and just disciple you in this moment? Nobody likes you, okay? <laughs> Nobody likes you. 
Uh, and so don't do that anymore, all right? Um, so anyway, I got on this plane and I was sitting next to this guy who was that guy who wanted to talk to me the entire flight. And it's cool, like when we're still on the runway on the tarmac, maybe, you know, and the little talk, where are you from, whatever. But once we get going and once I put my earbuds in, man, leave me alone, right? And so this guy didn't know. He wanted to talk the whole time. And so we get going in the conversation. He was asking, where are you from? You know, Nashville area. Uh, where are you going? I, I was going to speak at a conference somewhere. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, or what, what do you do? And so he starts asking me this question. And when people start asking me that question, like, what do you do as a church leader, as a pastor, I often don't know how to answer that question because it's, it's super uncomfortable because I don't know what people's preconceived ideas are about what pastors are, right? Do they think pastors are like the guy that's on the street corner with the repent now, the end is near, you know, sign? Does he think I'm that guy? Does he think I like wear a, a suit and tie everywhere and, you know, carry my King James 1611 Bible around and bless you, brother, bless you, praise the Lord, you know, all the time? Like, is that what he thinks? Sometimes you tell people you're a pastor, they'll shut down on you. If they accidentally throw out a profanity, it's like, oh, sorry, pastor, reverend, I know, you know, whatever, I'm sorry, I, you know, and do that. And so yeah, I just don't know. And so I, I'm going through this whole process in my mind, like, what do I tell this guy? And so finally I just said, I work at a church back in the Nashville area. And he was like, cool. So you're like a priest or whatever. And I'm like, uh, kind of like, I don't know. You know, I don't know what he's thinking, but the reality is that what the Bible says about me and what the Bible says about you is that you technically are a priest. And so am I. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This idea of priesthood, the Bible says about you that you are a priest. And when you hear that, you go, what? That didn't even make sense to me because you think of priest, you think of this guy. And you think of like, he's you got like this aura around him and you know, he's like, oh, you know, just that music just follows him around everywhere, like a, an angel choir singing around him. And you know, he wears the collar and the robe. That's what you think of. But regardless of what your preconceived ideas of a priest is, the Bible says that you are a priest. And God wants you to know that you are a priest. And so we're going to unpack this concept today um, from 1 Peter, chapter two, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And we're only going to read just a couple of verses today. We're really going to hone in on this one verse. Let me show you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, but you, 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 you are a chosen race. Here it is, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. The Bible has just told us, Peter has just said, hey, 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 God wants you to think of yourself as a priest. When you think of yourself and you think of how God thinks about you and what your identity is in him, you think of yourself as a priest. And there's a reason he says that. There are some heavy implications around that. There's some reasons why he wants us to think of ourselves as a priest. And I'm gonna give you four of those reasons, okay? Four reasons, four implications of our priesthood. Number one, it's this. He wants you to think of yourself as a priest because you have unrestricted access. You have unrestricted access to God. Did you know that in the first century, the Roman world thought that Christians were atheists. They actually accused Christians of, of being atheists. And there's a reason for that. Um, see, the Christians, they weren't in those days, they, they weren't overtly religious, right? They, they, they didn't go to like big ornate temples to offer their worship there. They mostly met in homes, actually. They didn't have formal professional priests. They didn't offer sacrifices. And so the Roman world really couldn't fathom this idea of, of worship, of uh, access to God without a temple, without priests, without sacrifice. And the reason the Roman world couldn't kind of conceive of that is because in the Old Testament, if someone wanted access to God, it always happened in a temple, always happened in a temple. Specifically, there was a part of the temple that was behind a big veil and it was called the Holy of Holies. And the, the only person with unrestrained access into the presence of God, which resided inside that veil, was the high priest. And he could only go in one time a year on what's called the Day of Atonement. So he would go in and he would offer not only sacrifices for his own sin, but he would also offer sacrifices for everybody else's sin. He was the only one with access to the presence of God. And man, people like... Uh, 
prostitutes and people like lepers or anyone who was considered what the Bible would call unclean, like those kinds of people, they weren't in, uh, like it didn't have access to the Holy of Holies or the inner courts or the outer courts or any part of the temple whatsoever. They couldn't even come to the temple. If they show up at the temple, they were denied access altogether. Get off the property completely. Anybody who was considered unclean was ushered out of the property. But what happened is when Jesus died on the cross, something spectacular and supernatural happened at that exact moment. See, what the Bible says is that at the moment Jesus died on the cross, the ground began to rumble and shake. And when the ground began to shake, supernaturally, the veil that separated the presence of God from everybody else was ripped from the top to the bottom, dividing the the, the veil and opening access to God to anybody, anybody, even the unclean, even those types of people, prostitutes and lepers and people with uh, physical ailments, all, for the, that's why the Bible would say, whosoever will let him or her come, right? And so what happened when Jesus died was because of Jesus, God was declaring to the world that there was no more going to priests, there was no more making sacrifices because through Jesus now, you and I and everybody, whosoever will, has access, unrestricted access to the presence of God. As a priest, listen, as a priest, you have, you, a priest, has unrestricted access. Not only that, but you have, look, you have unmerited acceptance. As a priest, you have unmerited acceptance. Um, Did you notice in the passage, and this is a little phrase that sometimes can throw people because there's some difference uh, in theological perspective around this little um, phrase. And the phrase is chosen. Uh, Because you are a chosen, but but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Now, what theologians point out about this verse is that the priesthood, royal priesthood phrase is like the hub and all of these other phrases are like the spokes from that hub that modify the idea of being uh, a, a royal priesthood, okay? And so what he's saying is that you're not just a priest, you're also a chosen priest. You are chosen. Um, now, the reason that he says that is because in the Old Testament, he's kind of he's talking about what would happen in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was divided into 12 tribes, but there was only one of those tribes that was a chosen tribe, that was a special tribe that was called the tribe of the Levites. And they were chosen to be priests. They were the ones that were chosen to have access to God, to have uh, unlimited access to God. And so that wasn't something, listen, that wasn't something that was earned by merit. That wasn't something that you could become or you could gain, or if you do enough good stuff, you could accomplish. No, listen, it was by God's sovereign choice that the Levites were chosen. And now what Peter is saying is as a priest, I don't want you, Peter says, just to think of yourself as a priest with unrestrained access. I want you to think of yourself as a priest who's been chosen, who has unmerited acceptance. And listen, that is very, very, very good news. For us, because we all to some degree struggle with rejection, with the opposite of acceptance, with rejection. Um, some of you felt that this week. You wanted somebody to be at your home for the holidays, and they weren't there for your Thanksgiving meal because your relationship with them is broken and you feel rejected by that person. For some of you, uh, maybe it's at work. You feel rejected by your boss. You keep getting passed over for the promotion. Or you keep getting uh, passed over for you know, the, the, the sale leads that you really want. And so you feel rejected by your boss or by somebody else at work. Maybe your marriage is in trouble right now and you're feeling rejected by your spouse. Maybe your kids are rebellious. You're feeling rejected by your kids. Maybe you're a teenager and there's somebody really important in your life and you're feeling rejected by that person. Listen to me. The height of acceptance is being chosen. The height of acceptance is being chosen. Listen, the Bible is saying to us, you might be rejected by everybody else, but you are not uh, uh, rejected by God. You are accepted by God. He chose you. He chose you. Um, 
A few years ago, uh, I had the really cool opportunity to be a part of a publishing project that honestly, I really don't know how somebody with an Alabama education got to be a part of. Uh, I, uh, there's this guy who um, was a football coach named Joe Gibbs. And about half of you know who that is. And the other half of you have no clue who Joe Gibbs is. Uh, he was the coach of uh, the Washington Redskins for years and years, won a few Super Bowls, the Washington football team, sorry, uh, and for, for years and years and, uh, and won a few Super Bowls. Now he owns a NASCAR team. And uh, so he wrote this book uh, called The Game Plan for Life. He's a strong Christian, wrote this book. And so I was a part of the publishing team that published this book. So we fly up to Charlotte where his NASCAR team like resides or whatever. And there's this thousands of square foot uh, shop where they build these race cars and his offices are there and everything. And so we sit down in the boardroom, the publishing team and him and some of his team. And we're talking through the book and mapping it out, you know, whiteboarding some stuff. And then at the end of the day, about two, three o'clock, he says to everybody, hey, you want to tour the race car shop? And of course I'm from Alabama. I was like, race cars, yeah, let's do this, you know? And so uh, we get up and we, we walk around through the shop and he's showing us all this. There's this museum there and all his Super Bowl rings are there, his NASCAR championships, all these helmets from football teams and also NASCAR drivers are all in there, super cool. And so we're walking through this, this thing and he's showing us where they set the aerodynamics for the car, you know, where they build the engines. Uh, they make their own oil, which blew my mind. It's crazy, he's showing us all this stuff. And I got so enthralled with this tour that there's this group of about 10 of us and we're walking around and Coach Gibbs is showing us everything, you know, and um, I got so enthralled with some part of the story uh, of the tour that I, I like zoned in so much that the group left me and I'm looking at this thing, whatever it was, and I look up and they're all gone and they had gone through a door where there was restricted access. And so I'm like, oh shoot. So uh, I leave and I go over to that door and I start to try to open it and it won't open. And so I start pressing on the door, it won't open, knocked on the door and this guy peeks his head out uh, through the window of the door and I said, I need to come in. And he opened the door, it was a security guard and he said, uh, I'm sorry, sir, you can't get through here. You, you don't belong in here. And Coach Gibbs heard that and he was there only just around the corner. He heard it and he walked around and he looked at me and he looked at the guy and looked at me and looked back at the guy and he said, Chris is with me. This guy's with me, he can come in. And see, this is what the Bible's teaching, that when God chooses you, that basically what God is doing is he's looking at all of you and I who might be rejected by everybody else who don't belong here, right? And he looks at us and he says, he's with me, she's with me. And it's not just Coach Gibbs, a Super Bowl winning you know, coach or a NASCAR champion team owner, it's the God of the universe, Right, like looking at you and me and through Jesus saying, he's with me, she's with me. Guys, that is good news. That's good news. That's unmerited acceptance. Because of Jesus, you have uh, unrestricted access. You have unmerited acceptance to God. And those two things together are an incredible, incredible um, privilege. But listen, with great privilege, comes a great responsibility, right? Let me show you in the passage. Peter actually says that. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. And what Peter is saying right here is not only do you have those two other things, but as a priest, you also have a unique assignment. You have a unique assignment. Um, you see it in the Old Testament, the idea of priesthood. In the Old Testament, priests had access, they not only had access to God, but they also had responsibilities that nobody else had. See, uh, it was the priest's responsibility to be experts in the Levitical legal system of the day. It was the priest's responsibility to be experts in the rituals that they were to execute for the people. Uh, it was the, the priest's responsibility to know how to make the sacrifices. It was his job. In fact, if you were a person who just decided, I'm gonna skip all that and I'm gonna just build my own altar in the backyard and offer up a sacrifice to God, by law, you could actually have been executed in that day. It wasn't your job. It was the priest's job to make the sacrifice for you. The professionals did the work. Everybody else was just passive. But listen, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 61, the prophet Isaiah speaks up and he has this incredible prophecy where he says, God is raising up for himself a generation, a nation of priests. And Peter says in this passage, 
that we've been, we're a holy nation, a, a chosen uh, a nation, a royal priesthood. Peter's basically saying, hey, that prophecy in Isaiah 61, it's fulfilled now in a group of people called the church. What Jesus said is, Jesus said, hey, 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 uh, I've been sent on mission and I'm raising up, Matthew 16, I've been ra I'm raising up for myself a church, a people. On this rock, I will build my church. The word is ecclesia in the original language. It means army. I'm raising up for myself an army of people. Jesus would say at another place, he would say, just as the Father has sent me, so I'm also sending you. I'm raising up for myself an army, a people, a people who will live sent, that I'm sending to fulfill that prophecy in Isaiah 61. And Peter now says, it's here. It's called the church. Um, just as Jesus said, just as uh, I've been sent, so I am sending you. Every member, Jesus is saying, and Peter is saying, every member is a minister. We all have a unique assignment. Theologians call this the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. And the idea is that the world won't change because of uh, a community with a gifted pastor. No, no, what, what changes the world is not a community with a gifted pastor. What changes the world is a community of gifted people who understand and live out this idea that just like Jesus, they too have been sent to live as a priest. They too, you too, we too have a unique assignment to proclaim, as the, the verse said, to proclaim the excellencies of the one who brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. Listen, some of us are called to do that formally, pastors. But all of us, every one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a priest, the Bible says. So therefore, though all of us are called, uh, some of us are called to do it formally, all of us are called to do this relationally. Yeah. All of us. You have a unique Assignment. Um, one of my favorite verses that really unpacks this, if you've been around for any length of time, you've heard me quote this. In fact, I think I quoted it last week. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it says, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You're his workmanship. Poema is the Greek word, masterpiece. You're his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. Why? Created for what? For the purpose of good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. In other words, God's been having a dream about redeeming the world and his dream about redeeming the world involves you. And so therefore he created you as a masterpiece. He wove you together exactly the way you wanted, he wanted you. And, and you're his masterpiece and he created you so that you would join him in the good work of redeeming the world. And listen, you weren't an accident. He's planned beforehand that you would do that. And that you would leverage those things. You would walk in those things. In other words, let me say it this way. God has given you and me and all of us who are followers of Jesus unique abilities and unique passions and unique experiences that make you a unique masterpiece to minister to others. Listen, in only a way that you can. Nobody, you listen, you're a terrible somebody else. You are a 10 out of 10 you, yep. right? God has made you, two of y'all are excited about that. Good, that's good. Okay, so God has made you a unique masterpiece to minister to people in only a way that you can. Listen, listen, listen. Um, there are people that only you can minister to. There are needs that only you can meet. There are uh, hands that only you can hold, right? Because, because of your uniqueness, because of your passions and abilities and experience, you see the world differently than everybody else. And so there, there are people that only you can reach. And listen, the, the vulnerability in a church this size is that it's really easy to kind of slip in and slip out and hide and not completely live in this and leverage this. Because it, it's, it's good, it, it's, it's like normal to think not good, but normal to think uh, that, man, a church that size, they have a lot of gifted people volunteering and on staff and whatever. They don't need me. But see what the Bible teaches when it says that you're a masterpiece and that you're a priest and that we should walk in those things. What the Bible is saying is that there are people that need to be reached in Spring Hill that if you don't leverage your, your uh, gift and identity as a priest, they may not be reached. 
that there are people here who need to be ministered to that may not be ministered to, that there are hands that need to be held and people that need to be loved and valued that may not be unless you walk in the masterpiece that you are that God has created and leverage who he says you are, a priest, and proclaim the excellencies of the one who brought you out of darkness into marvelous light. That's what God's calling us to. Listen, uh, that's why I love um, people like my brother, Craig Aldana. Uh, Craig it goes to our Columbia location, volunteers and serves there. And uh, I love Craig Aldana. Some of you even here in Spring Hill, you know him. Craig's a personal trainer, huge guy, really strong. Took me to work out one time at the gym around the corner here from our Spring Hill camp. Guys, I couldn't keep up with Craig Aldana. He, this dude, is he's incredible. He's a personal trainer, and, but he doesn't see his responsibility as just being a personal trainer. He sees that as an opportunity for him to proclaim the excellencies of the, the one who called him out of darkness into marvelous light. And so he's, what he does is he'll kind of make his way around the gym, getting to know people. And over time, he'll say, hey, I've got a group of people that we hang out after we work out. We hang out back in the yoga studio. We circle up some chairs. We talk about Jesus and what he's doing in our lives. Would you wanna be a part of that? And I don't know what he calls the group. I'm gonna call it Bods for God because I think that's awesome. So <laughs> Craig's Bods for God here. So last couple of weeks ago, we had baptism. Sunday and Craig baptized somebody from that group. And I can tell that story many times over how Craig Aldana is ministering to people, proclaiming the excellencies of the God who brought him out of darkness into marvelous light in that domain that he finds himself in. He's not just a personal trainer. No, he's a priest sent to that domain, not to proclaim those excellencies formally from a stage, but relationally in that domain. Uh, My friend, Kirk, Played football in high school and in college. And uh, because uh, he played in college, he had some opportunities to learn some things and gain some expertise that a lot of people didn't have. And so here's what Kirk does. He's an insurance agent now. But he'll leave work in the fall at about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon and go over to the local high school and volunteer as the special teams coach and the chaplain for the local high school football team. Why? Not just because he loves football. Sure, he does. That's his passion. But he has this experience that nobody else has. He has these abilities that nobody else has. Therefore, he sees needs that only people, uh, that, that only he can see. And so he's using all of that together to, in that domain, Proclaim the excellencies of God who brought him out of darkness into marvelous light. He's been a priest in that domain. And Kirk has baptized high school football players because he's leveraging those opportunities. I could keep going. I have a friend, Jeff, who's a deer hunter. He loves to deer hunt, but he doesn't love it just for the sport of the kill. He says, I, always, I never go without taking somebody with me. And when I pick them up from their house, until the time I get to the deer stand, I have a captive audience. And so I'll spend that time investing in them, building relationships and pouring my life into them. I use my passion for deer hunting to proclaim the excellencies of the one who brought me out of darkness into marvelous light. Do you see this? This is him living as a priest. He has a unique assignment and so do you. And the church misses out. The community misses out if we sit by passive while the professionals do the work of ministry. There are people that only you can reach. And maybe you connect with that emotionally and you go, man, I can do that, that's awesome. But you go, but I don't really know where to start. Here, I wanna get super practical for the last few minutes of this sermon. I wanna give you four practical ways you can begin to live out this idea of your unique assignment. Four practical ideas. They won't be on the screen, but if you wanna jot them down, here they are. Um, Number one is you simply reteach what you're learning. You find somebody at work, somebody that just, you know, they like you, they kind of lean in, they wanna learn from you or they wanna have conversations with you. And during conversation, you're just talking about what the Lord's teaching you. You're reteaching what you're learning. Sometimes when we think about making disciples, we think we have to know, you know, have memorized the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, or know the four spiritual laws, or have all this theological knowledge. That's not, I mean, that can be discipleship. You know what discipleship really is? Reteaching what you're learning. Reteaching what, as you've been discipled, you begin to leverage that to disciple. You're simply reteaching what you're learning. And so as God speaks to you in a sermon, God speaks to you in a book you're reading, your personal devotion, or maybe your bridge group, you just simply hang out with somebody, have it on your mind, reteach what God's teaching you. That's it. That's it. Super simple. That's number one. Number two, leverage your greatest hardship. If you've been around for any length of time, you heard me say this a dozen times, your greatest misery will often become your greatest ministry. Maybe for you, your greatest hardship is your marriage was on the rocks. Maybe you lost a marriage. Maybe you've lost your job. 
Maybe you had uh, cancer or some other kind of disease. We've all had unique hardships because of the the brokenness of our world. But listen, uh, what the enemy has meant for evil, God wants to use for good. So what if we leverage those hardships and start pouring into people who also are struggling with the same thing? Uh, This is like um, my my grandmother, um, she uh, has been in heaven for several years now, but she had cancer twice. And after she had it the first time, she made it her ministry to go to doctors, oncologist's office and places where they would do chemo and radiation treatments and simply walk around the room, work the room. That's the kind of woman she was. She'd work that room and she'd find somebody that was hurting. And she'd sit down with them and she'd love on them. And she'd share with them, she'd proclaim the excellencies of the one who brought her out of darkness into marvelous light. And listen, I learned more about relational ministry from my grandmother than I ever learned from a seminary professor. My grandmother recognized her gift, as a, a, her identity as a priest, and she was leveraging her hardship to live in that identity. So leverage your hardship, that's number two. Number three, be in a bridge group. Be in a bridge group. And you go, Many of us think about being in a bridge group and we think, well, it, I don't really get anything out of it. It's, I don't have time. I don't get anything out of that. But listen, what if we thought of it not as a consumer, what we can get out of it? What if we thought of being a bridge group as an opportunity for us to pour into people, to use our abilities and our passions uh, you know, and our experiences to, to serve people, to reach people that others can't reach, to hold hands that others can't hold, to minister to people that others can't minister to. So maybe be in a bridge group. Um, the fourth thing, this is super easy and low hanging fruit for all of us. Invite somebody to Christmas at the bridge. Did you know people are exponentially more interested and uh, open to attending a worship gathering during the Christmas holidays than any other time of the year? So just say, man, if I don't get anything else, I'm gonna leave this place, I'm gonna walk out of here and I'm gonna invite somebody to Christmas at the bridge because I'm a priest with a unique assignment. So you you have uh, in your identity as a priest, unrestricted access. You have unmerited acceptance. But number three, you have a unique assignment. So the question is, where do you get the strength, the, the courage, where do you get the motivation and the freedom to walk in this? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's because, number four, you have an unwavering anchor. An unwavering anchor. You've, in fact, you see that earlier in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse 4, it says, how do you gain the confidence? How do you have the courage? How do you have the motivation? You come to him. You come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. There it is again. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Remember earlier in the sermon, I showed you that picture. And uh, that picture is not just a stock photo of a model of a priest. That's a real priest. His name is Michael Judge. And Michael Judge is a priest, was a priest in New York City. And uh, he had done that for years and was actually the chaplain for the New York City Fire Department. And one Tuesday morning, uh, just before nine o'clock, they get a call and uh, he hops on a ladder truck or whatever and he rides with the firemen to lower Manhattan to the site of what they thought at the time uh, was a, uh, an accidental plane crash into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. And some of you who are old enough, you remember exactly where you were when that news broke about what happened at the World Trade Center. Michael Judds hops off that ladder truck and he goes into the lobby uh, of the tower and the firemen are just rushing everywhere, taking care of people. Uh, And uh, Michael Judge walks around the lobby and he said it was his responsibility, he thought, to walk in the lobby and pace back and forth, back and forth and just intercede for the people that were in trouble above him. And so he's walking back and forth, just praying, interceding for those people that are headed toward death. They didn't know it. At about 10.30, the uh, ground begins to shake around Michael Judge as he's interceding for those people that are in trouble, in danger. And you know the rest of the story. Uh, The tower crumbles on top of him and the weight of the building crushes Michael Judge. And actually, Michael Judge, this uh, priest, became the first to verify death of the 9-11 tragedies. Now, here's why I tell you his story. Because what Peter has just told us and what the Bible teaches is that 2,000 years before Michael Judge, there was another priest. And this priest's name was Jesus. And this priest 
was on the cross. And what he was doing on the cross, the Bible teaches, is he was interceding for you and me, people who are in danger, people who are in trouble because of our sin. And while we were yet sinners, Romans says, Christ died for us, died for us. See, it wasn't the weight of a building that crushed Jesus. It was the weight of the sin of the world that crushed him. And what he was doing is he was interceding for us, giving his life for us so that we could have unrestricted access to the Father, so that we could uh, be accepted by the Father, so that we would have then a unique assignment to pick up. Jesus said, I've been sent, now I'm sending you. So when Jesus went to the cross and we anchor our lives in the unwavering anchor of Jesus, what we're saying is we're also, we're not gonna be passive with that. We're picking up the mission that Jesus left for us and we're continuing that mission until it's complete. And that mission is bringing heaven to earth. That mission is reaching every people group on the planet with the message of the gospel, with the, with the excellencies of the one who brought us out of darkness into marvelous light. Right? That's what it means to be a priest. And what the Bible has just said to us is when you understand that and when that grips your heart, when you run to him, when it grips your heart, you can't help but run to him. And then you offer yourself as a sacrifice to him that's acceptable to him through Jesus. Uh, D.L. Moody was one of the greatest preachers of his day. And uh, D.L. Moody talking about this passage and this idea, here's what he said. He said, I, I wanna be that kind of person. Here was his exact, his exact quote. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do through one man fully consecrated to him. And he go on to say, by God's grace, I will be that man. He's saying, when it comes to being a priest, when it comes to understanding my unique assignment and offering myself to the, to the unwavering anchor of Jesus, I will be that man. And the world's never seen anything like it. Now, I would say that D.L. Moody was short-sighted. <laughs> I would say that uh, what D.L. Moody was not thinking about was this community of faith that we call the Bridge Church. And I would add to what D.L. Moody said, I think, man, the, the Lord has done incredible things in our past and in our present as a church, but the greatest days of the influence of the Bridge Church are ahead, amen? The greatest days are ahead. And I think if I would add to D.L. Moody, what I would say is the world has yet to see what God can do through 3,000 men and women, teenagers, boys and girls strong, who are fully consecrated to God and who understand their identity as a priest. You are priests. Bridge family, let's walk in that as we leave this place and embrace the mission that God's called us to. The world will never be the same. Let's walk in it. That's my prayer for us today, okay? Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much that Jesus was willing, knowing that he would be crushed by the weight of our sin, to go to the cross and pay the price for us. God, would you today, right now in this moment, wherever we are, captivate our hearts with that again? Jesus, thank you. You don't just call us to that, to sit passively on the sidelines, but you give us a, a drive and a passion to embrace the mission that you've called us to. And so Father, I pray that you would give every man and woman, boy and girl in this place, my brothers and sisters, the grace to embrace that mission anew and afresh. And that God, we recognize that you wanna do incredible things more than we could ever ask or imagine through us. So God, would you use us in this community and all around the world for the sake of your glory? Jesus, uh, we love you, but we thank you that you love us so much more. And it's in your name that we pray, amen, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for watching the Bridge Church YouTube channel. We're so glad you joined us. We hope that you felt the welcome home of Christ right for your screen. Um, here at The Bridge, we believe that the gospel is good news worth sharing. And so we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel, to share on social media, and you can tag us at at BridgeChurchTN. That's at BridgeChurchTN. And if you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do so by clicking the link in the description of the video. Hey, once again, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to find out more information about The Bridge Church, you can go to bridge.tv. That's bridge.tv. And we hope to see you here soon.